A Course in What? with Cynthia Morgan. Hey, course friends, welcome to A Course in What? I'm Cynthia Morgan, and this is a podcast in which I read and discuss the text of A Course in Miracles. And we are on podcast episode 27. And A Course in What? is a free weekly podcast that comes out every Tuesday. This marks our six-month anniversary of doing this podcast, and we've had 8,000 downloads so far. So I just want to say thank you if you've stuck in there with me, and I really appreciate it. Um, I've been surprised by the number of downloads that we've had, and especially because this is such a niche kind of podcast, you know, it doesn't have a broad audience. It's a very specific audience, and not just a audience of A Course in Miracles, which there's plenty of those Course in Miracles people, but people who within that actually want to go through the text line by line. And I think those are fewer and farther between. So I really appreciate you spending time with me and looking at A Course in Miracles. And it's helped me so much along the way and deepened my understanding and my connection to the course. And I hope it's done the same for you. So again, thank you very much. And so we are on chapter three, the innocent perception, section one, atonement without sacrifice. And that's on page 36 in the text. In the last episode, episode 26, we read the first two paragraphs and discussed them. And today we will read paragraphs three, four, and five. All right, so let's just dive right in. He continues his correction of some traditional Christian ideas those first two paragraphs spoke to the crucifixion, and he'll continue with that theme, the theme of sacrifice, throughout the rest of this section. All right, so paragraph three, sentence one. The statement, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is a misperception by which one assigns his own, quote, evil past to God. So our, quote, evil past is our separation from God our original sin or mistaken perception. But as we all know, the separation never really occurred. It's just a mistaken thought in our mind. And so that's why the word evil is in quotes here. So we sin, we separate from God, which leads to guilt, which then leads to a belief in punishment. Our underlying guilt gets projected onto God, making him a vengeful, wrathful God. We couldn't believe in a vengeful God if we didn't have those thoughts against ourselves, the belief in guilt and punishment in our own mind. The natural dynamic of the mind is to project out what's in it. So we are simply projecting our quote unquote evil onto God. Two, the evil past has nothing to do with God. The evil is the thought of separation in our mind. It doesn't have anything to do with God because God doesn't have a belief in separation. Three, he did not create it and he does not maintain it. So here he's clarifying again what we've been programmed in this world to believe, that God is a punishing God. Four, God does not believe in retribution. If we've never left God, what is there to punish? Five. His mind does not create that way. God is love. Six, he does not hold your evil deeds against you. So God doesn't hold what we do in the world against us. He doesn't hold the belief in separation against us. He doesn't punish us because we fell asleep. He doesn't hold anything against us because his mind doesn't think that way. Seven, is it likely that he would hold them against me? So if Jesus is our brother, then why would he be any different than us? If he doesn't hold anything against us, why would he hold anything against Jesus? He wouldn't. It's a silly notion. Eight, be very sure that you recognize how utterly impossible this assumption is and how entirely it arises from projection. Again, projection is a Freudian term. What we don't like within ourselves, we then project out of our mind and see it in others rather than in ourselves. We all project. It's just a simple psychological dynamic of our mind, of our ego mind. And on a mass level, we projected the thought of separation into a worldly experience. 
But we also just project that thought in our daily lives. The guilt in our mind is so burdensome that we have to project it outward. That's how the ego tells us we will find our innocence. If I project what I don't like within me out onto somebody else, then in that moment, the ego tells me I'm no longer it. It's like a game of tag. I tag you and you're it. I'm no longer it. And we did that same thing with this world. The ego told us to project that thought of separation outward. We made this world and now we have other things and people outside of ourselves on whom we can project that guilt. Nine, this kind of error is responsible for a host of related errors, including the belief that God rejected Adam and forced him out of the Garden of Eden. Okay, so I just talked about that. That's that same idea of separation, rejecting Adam out of the Garden of Eden, which of course, God didn't reject us. God didn't reject the one son, which is Adam, and force him out of oneness, the Garden of Eden or heaven. It was just a mistaken belief that we came to believe was true. And then we've projected it onto this God who we believe rejects us, punishes us, etc. 10. It is also why you may believe from time to time that I am misdirecting you. So I can't help but think that this sentence was actually for Helen. And Helen was known to be obstinate, and she often questioned during her scribing of A Course in Miracles what Jesus was saying to her. And so I think that he's talking directly to her. But I believe that it was left in A Course in Miracles because it's really for all of us, ultimately. We can all relate to this idea that Jesus or God is misdirecting us or isn't there for us. If we start with a mistaken perception of separation, we will then naturally project that onto Jesus and we won't hear his message clearly. It'll be filtered through that projection or through the ego. And that just leads to a lot of confusion. And that's why I believe he's saying um, all of this can lead from time to time to this idea that you think I'm misdirecting you. 11. I have made every effort to use words that are almost impossible to distort, but it is always possible to twist symbols around if you wish. His words have been twisted in the past through religion and through time. So he says he's being very careful in choosing his words here. He doesn't want the same thing to happen again with A Course in Miracles, but of course he knows it can. That's why he's saying it's always possible. People project onto the Course too, just like they do onto the Bible, and it can't be helped. It's just part of the deal with the ego. Paragraph 4, Sentence 1. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. He comes back to the very important idea of sacrifice here, which is so central to traditional Christianity. God wants us to sacrifice. We must sacrifice in order to get to God. It's a notion, he says, that's totally unknown to God, this idea of sacrifice. Again, he's using strong words here. It's not just unknown. Sacrifice is totally unknown to God. Two, it arises solely from fear, and frightened people can be vicious. So it, meaning sacrifice, arises from fear. This idea that we have to please God or he'll send us to hell. So we feel we must sacrifice in some way, and that's what Christianity teaches. Sacrifice is the gateway to heaven. And here he's saying that sacrifice actually comes from the ego, the concept is based on fear. And the second part of this sentence, frightened people can be vicious, is a way of understanding for us when people do really hurtful things in the world, they're frightened. Frightened people can be vicious. Now, this can mean frightened people of religious belief that he's talking about who project that thought out into the world and oppress others like gays or 
other religions or war, religious persecution, or just when you see someone in your day-to-day -day life over the news or whatever who rapes or murders, underneath all of that viciousness, he's saying, is an unconscious fear of God. It's their guilt that gets projected out. And that guilt is so burdensome to our mind that it's then seen in the other or in others who are separate from us. And then, of course, it has to be destroyed in that other person, either with cutting them down just verbally and emotionally or literally murdering them. It's really ugly, this dynamic. It's vicious, he's saying. Notice again the strong choice of words to describe this process. Three, sacrificing in any way is a violation of my injunction that you should be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. So this whole idea of sacrifice goes completely against what he's saying. To be merciful is the opposite of projection. To be merciful is to be forgiving. It's to see a connection, a oneness in everyone and everything and understand that I too project just as others do in my own way, that we're all doing this. And if I didn't project in some way, I wouldn't even be here because my body, this world is all a projection of a separation from God. And on some level, I too believe in this. God doesn't think with sacrifice, he's saying, and therefore neither should I. God is forgiving and God is love. Therefore, I must be forgiving and loving, and not just towards others, but also towards myself. Four, it has been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves. So Christians in particular live in a deep fear with constant guilt because of this wrathful God, and it's at the forefront of their consciousness. As we talked about in the last episode, it really guides their daily choices. And so he's saying it's really hard to get past that mentality and be merciful with themselves, let alone other people. Really, it's about being kind with yourself, being merciful with yourself. We, and not just Christians, are constantly beating ourselves up. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not rich enough. And we need to learn to be more forgiving and merciful with ourselves and others. Love yourself by accepting yourself exactly as you are in this moment. Good teachers never terrorize their students. The goal of healing, according to the Course, is to lessen fear. So if a teacher is increasing fear, then he's keeping the student from reaching the very goal that he's saying he's trying to help him reach, that goal of healing. And we talked about that also in the last episode, that catch-22 of Christianity, that it says this is the way to God. In fact, it's the only way to God. But the teachings are based on fear, which keeps most Christians from God, from really knowing that they are innocent, they're um, one with their brothers, etc., and again, this is just a generalization of Christianity. There are real Christians, as Jesus calls them, that can find their way to God, of course. But it begins with, as he's mentioned, questioning the way that some Christians teach these tenets. And that is teaching it based on fear. Six, to terrorize is to attack. And this results in rejection of what the teacher offers. Attack is projection. So when a teacher projects, he's not offering anything of value. He's just keeping himself and his students stuck in a world of time and space and guilt and fear. Seven, the result is learning failure. The student can't really learn from a teacher like this, but he can learn from a teacher, a good teacher, like Jesus, who's teaching us through this course. He's an example of a good teacher. He's not terrorizing us. Rather, he's gently awakening us. Paragraph five, I have been correctly referred to as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. 
But those who represent the lamb as blood-stained do not understand the meaning of the symbol. Okay, here he goes again in reinterpreting and correcting this idea. So lamb in the Christian sense is the sacrificial lamb. It's so interesting because on top of everything in Christianity and how violent it is, they then reference animal sacrifice and compare that to Jesus as a compliment. He's a sacrificial lamb. It's totally insane. So here he's saying, you're right to see me as a lamb of God, but not as a blood-stained one. Um, it almost makes me laugh. It's so ridiculous as I say it out loud. Um, it's so silly. And he'll go on to explain this. Sentence two. Correctly understood, it is a very simple symbol that speaks of my innocence. The lamb symbolizes innocence. And he's reinterpreting this whole idea. I have to believe that some of this never even happened. I mean, what the Bible is saying. Did John really say that about Jesus, that he's a lamb? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But with A Course in Miracles, Jesus is doing something really smart. He's taking what we know and what we think is true and reinterpreting it to bring us out of guilt and out of the past. And sometimes it's better to not say that didn't happen at all, but rather to say, let me reinterpret what you steadfastly believed happened. Um, and I can even see the benefit of that with people in thinking about their past. Some people are really, really stuck in things having happened, like in their childhood or whatever, in a certain way. And it may be true or it may not be true. But I found as a hypnotherapist, if they really believe that things happen that way, it's best to reinterpret that rather than to tell somebody that it didn't happen because it's going against their whole frame of reference and reality. So he's sort of doing that with us here. I don't know whether these things happened or didn't happen. I don't know whether the crucifixion actually happened or didn't happen, but he's reinterpreting it all for us. And that is really helpful. Three, the lion and the lamb lying down together symbolize that strength and innocence are not in conflict, but naturally live in peace. So really they're one in the same. That strength of God um, comes from the belief in understanding that you are an innocent child of God. That's how you get to know that strength. Four, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God is another way of saying the same thing. So pure of heart and lamb, these are both symbols of innocence. You can only know God through your innocence, not your guilt. Five, a pure mind knows the truth, and this is its strength. So he's saying the same thing in different ways over and over. The truth that I am at one with God, that's my eternal reality. Nothing I do or say or think can destroy that. I can block it from my mind, from my awareness, through my fear and my guilt. But if I remember my innocence, I become invulnerable in the world or to the world. Not even death can hurt me. This is my strength. My mind is connected to God and to truth. Six, it does not confuse destruction with innocence because it associates innocence with strength not with weakness. It, meaning a pure mind, isn't confused because it isn't projecting guilt, which is destructive. There's no need to be so brutal and destructive towards sacrificial lambs or a sacrificial Christ in order to be innocent. All of that is a weakness because it's of the ego, which is weak. The ego seems strong, but it isn't. It isn't eternal. It's temporary. Strength is eternal, and that comes from God. This strength is then extended to everyone and everything, seeing the innocence in them as well. That's the beauty of a good teacher. We become teachers of God when we extend that innocence, that perception of what's really going on in the world out into other minds. And that's our truth. That's our strength in this world. 
And we'll stop there for today and we'll finish the rest of this section in the next episode. So thank you for joining me today. And if you would like to stay in touch, you know, we have a Facebook page just for this podcast. It's at facebook.com forward slash a course in what? And you can also contact me through my website, which is cynthiamorgan.us. Um, or you can call and leave a voicemail with a question or a comment. And that phone number direct line for A Course in What is 707-500-ACIW. And if you would like to say the summary of A Course in Miracles with me, that would be great. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God.